a great idea advances humanity, and we shouldn't be picky where it comes from. My name is Eleutherio Solea, and my big idea is that studying the factors that make, motive, that make innovation more likely can be used to make it more socially just and likely. Great ideas come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, from the tech we have to have, to the social movements pushing for a better future, to the subtle agricultural advances that keep humanity fed. A great idea can make its way around the world, and you might never hear about it. Take, for example, Dr. Norman Borlaug. Dr. Borlaug was your garden variety plants researcher, working in a US military research lab studying saltwater adhesives. He left said lab and sprouted the idea for dwarf wheat. Dwarf wheat doesn't blow over when it gets windy. It massively increases crop yields, and it's credited with saving a billion lives from starvation. It's living proof that great things can happen when people are supported to follow their aspirations, big or small. It's proof that your idea doesn't have to get as widespread as Velcro for it to stick and have value. That was one. <laughs> and have value. Can we change my slide? Thank you. So, let's talk about value for a bit. Value is not always or even often financial. The value comes from channeling your idea to create new possibilities for humanity. When I chat with people about innovation, they tend to think of the sorts of ideas that went viral, the ideas that got huge name recognition, and the ones that made gazillions of dollars. Spoiler alert, but I don't think that's necessarily true. A great idea, can, a great idea does not have to buy you a yacht for it to have been worthwhile and for it to have made a difference to humanity. Innovation is not only the domain of prodigies, big tech, and big business. It's for the thinkers and dreamers everywhere. And this means that I think that lots of things are innovative. Poetry is innovative. New social movements can be innovative. And new ways of putting together everyday things make lives kinder, richer, and brighter. How then do we make innovation more likely in the myriad of disciplines where it occurs? Well, that's my doctoral research, and uh, since I'm here, I'll talk to you about it. Can we have my slide? The motivation framework? Thank you. Perfect. Now, my doctoral research began like many others, by reading a lot of articles. We read everything we could get our hands on, me specifically. In my case, I read about what motivated innovation and I drew from a lot of different kinds of disciplines. I then surveyed, or I then interviewed 30 of Canada's brightest minds. I spoke to Nobel laureates, I spoke to artists, I spoke to engineers, and I spoke to corporate investors, and I learned everything that I could from them. And I listened to the recommendations of people. If they told me that somebody was innovative, I would Kool-Aid man it through a wall to invite them to participate in my study. Then, for good measure, I surveyed another 500 of them. And I organized what I found into this motivation framework, expectancy value cost theory. Now, what I learned, we, sorry, I need that framework, thank you. <laughs> now, let's talk about expectancies and values. This is what I get for forgetting my clicker. <laughs> the good folks are taking care of me, I promise. Expectancies and values. Expectancies are your belief that something can be done, that you are capable of doing something. It's an amalgam of confidence, self-concept, and self-efficacy. If I were to dare my friend Jenny to come on stage and do a backflip for $20, how likely would she take me up on it? I bet you would be a lot more likely if she had done gymnastics. If she had believed that she could do it, she'd be more likely to take a shot at it because she'd have had practice. That principle applies to innovation as well. If you've had a chance to practice the component skills, problem setting, design thinking, marketing, promotion, these sorts of component skills, you're more likely to be able to bring your idea to bear. Now, what about values? The other lift factor. Values come in three flavors, if you will. The first flavor uh, is intrinsic, task value. The value you get from something 
because you enjoy it. It fulfills your curiosity or you like doing it. It's that you would do this for its own sake. Who here is a runner? Goes for runs. Not me. Not me. I will run from things or for things. I will run from a bear. I will run for ice cream. There are people that are motivated to innovate because they like doing it. They enjoy the process. Wrestling with ideas is fun to them. That's a real motivation that people can stoke in learning environments and in workplaces. Let people pursue the ideas they're passionate about. Let people follow through on their plant cultivar splicing that leads to dwarf wheat. Second flavor, attainment task value. The belief or the value that you get from something because it fulfills you or you think it's important. It's identity fulfillment or perceived importance. The people working on developing green technologies and renewable energies have very good reason to believe that they are saving the planet. It's important to them. Or somebody who says that I am an innovator. They identify with it, so the process is motivating to them. They like doing it. You can stoke this in schools by letting people pick the sorts of assignments that they work on, obviously within reason, and by letting people have a degree of autonomy in their workplaces. Flavor number three, utility task value. Utility task value is the value you get from something because you will get this from it. You do this, you get this. It's very transactional. I watched Love Actually with my fiance so that she will watch Deadpool with me. <laughs> I do this to get this. True story, that happened. You do this to get this. This is the thing about, about people who are motivated to innovate because there's a financial payoff potentially to it. If I innovate, I'll make gazillions of dollars or I'll make a good living or something like that. This type of motivation in my research and with my samples was shown to be the weakest of the three types of values. In fact, done wrong, it actually, and 70 years of motivation research backs me on this one, it can actually ruin the other kinds of motivation if rewards are done wrong. So those are the lift factors, the things that make it more likely that somebody can innovate and the things we can do to make innovation more likely among our students and our workers. What about the hindering factors? What about costs? And there are very real costs when it comes to innovating. There's the effort, pressure, and time that someone has to put into innovating. What if I don't succeed? What happens if I don't get to follow through on my idea? Do I have a backup option? What about all this time that I've invested? There's one that I call the confronting status quos, but I think a little more poetically put is confronting the momentum of history. True story. Net Blockbuster had the ability to buy Netflix and didn't. The status quo was Blockbuster, but it is prevailable that something else will come along and overcome it. The people who made CDs made the people who made tape cassettes go bust. Innovation comes with a cost, and sometimes that is confronting the very momentum of history and the way that things are done. Think about a childhood place that you liked going to and think about it closing down. Try and convince someone that that is for the better. There's a real anxiety about change for usually good reasons in society. Now, what about the loss of alternatives? If I do this, I can't do this. Or the what does it say about me if I don't succeed following my idea? Does that make me a screen door on a submarine? Let's go next slide, please. These costs are very real and they are contextual. Power of context. <laughs> Although considering the amount of people talking about innovation, we might as well be calling it the power of innovation from now on. They'll change my slide to the next one. But um, <laughs> these costs are very real and they're very subjective. Different people from different life histories experience them differently than their peers. In my sample and my, and my study, folks who reported having a learning exceptionality reported 15% higher costs of innovating than their peers in the general population. 
the exact same values and expectancies, just they perceived the cost of innovating as being 15% more punishing. And the folks in my sample who identified as being a visible minority or from a historically marginalized group, they reported 28% higher costs than their peers in the general population. 15% and 28%. These seem like abstract amounts. And I'd like to put them into context for you. If I were a 15% faster runner, I would qualify for the Olympics. 15%. You would have the world's fastest runners, and then in lane six, me, Greek Daniel Radcliffe, ready to go. 15% mitigation of the cost of innovating, or 28% cost of, of, or 28 mitigation of the cost of innovating, would be huge in making the world a fairer place and making innovation more common. Now, we have a couple of ways to address this in context. First. We can have people practice how to, how to make and take safe, intelligent risks. How to be courageous with their ideas intellectually. We can pre-brief and debrief them in terms of what is involved in the process of innovating, thus preparing them for what can be a very costly process and telling them what the values, and expect, or what the values are of innovating and that they can do it, practicing the skills with them. We can practice safety net type measures and we can give them a sense of psychological safety to follow through on their ideas in learning environments and in workplaces. And we can have them work with peers that gives them security and shows them that innovators come in all sorts of shapes, shades, and sizes. We have two reasons to do this. We can make innovation more likely for two reasons. First, economically. A 2016 report by Nager and colleagues showed that the most effective way of making innovation more likely and common in society is not just investment in existing innovators or prodigies. It is investment in developing more people's talent, having more innovators ready to go and to mobilize their ideas. Reason number two, social justice. We can address real social inequities and disparities in our society by making innovation more likely and leveling the playing field by proactively mitigating costs. Mitigating these costs will go a long way to having more types of innovators in the world. And we have, as we recall, two ways to make that happen. First, we can increase the values and expectancies in schools workplaces, and environments to enable more people to see the value of innovating and believe that they can do it, and we can address and mitigate the costs of innovating to make it more likely that they'll be able to follow through in their ideas. So there we have it. Two good reasons to do it, two methods for doing it, and no good reason not to. We can make the world a kinder, fairer, and brighter place, while at the same time having more cool ideas bouncing around. And that, my friends, is an idea worth spreading. Thank you.